The process of making a modern tire begins in the Banbury. The Banbury gets its name from Farnley Banbury, who invented the machine over 75 years ago. It's a gravity-fed internal mixer that uses huge vertical steel rollers and lots of extreme physical pressure to blend the raw ingredients that go into making modern rubber. Now this is no ordinary kitchen mixer. The Banbury is three stories high. Since the process begins at the top and works its way down, I went to the top to meet Don Stevenson. The ingredients were fed into the Banbury in blocks. Don told me that the dark blocks were natural rubber harvested from rubber tree plantations in tropical zones all over the world. The white blocks were synthetic rubber manufactured in the U.S. Blending the two results in a highly durable product. Each of the ingredients was measured out precisely and chopped with a guillotine cutter. How do you know how much to cut off? Just experience, you learn what, about what weight it is. Down to about here, it's about 18 pounds. That's about 25. That's about 35. You got 35 pounds. Can I push them? Push them both at the same time. I've followed a lot of recipes in my life, but never one that required quite so much heavy lifting. Once we were finished loading in everything up top, I went down to the bottom to see what it looks like when it comes out of the mixer. That's where I met up with Matt Huddleston. Now, uh, this is where the, the rubber's coming out of the bottom of the bay right here. Yes. It's just falling out. Now, what's happening inside the bay barrier? There's rotors inside the bay barrier that are mixing the rubber and the compounds together. So, could you, would it be fair to say that this is kind of a kneading process yes. by rolling it again and again and again? We're yes. mixing it all together. The clumps of smooth black compound that drop out of the bottom of the Banbury are fed onto rollers that then press them out into a single even sheet of rubber. From there, it's on to the mill. I cut a starter strip of rubber off the Banbury roller and fed it onto the first roller of the mill. Think of it as threading the world's largest movie projector. The mill turns the mixture into long sheets of processed rubber. This pliable sheet rubber has now become the basic material that will be used to make up various components of a tire. Once it leaves the mill, it comes to Patty Nolan, who operates the laydown machine. I'm laying down the rubber, uh, looking for lumps, uh, making sure it's, the length is the right size. Uh, after the sheet of rubber gets stacked to a certain height, it's cut across and a fresh pallet is moved into place to begin a new stack. Each of these stacks, or batches of processed rubber, are now almost ready to be used to make tires. But one very important step remained. I lent Patty a hand by cutting a sample of the rubber for testing. Now, where's this going? Into the lab. The lab? Yeah. Are they going to check this right away? Uh -huh. So they'll know if there's any problem with this batch. Right. And if they're they, checking for what? Formula? Formulation? Yeah, if it's hot or uh, they do all kinds of tests in there. But it's then immediate. It, That's the important thing. Yeah. Not right now. While the testing is being done, the processed rubber is carefully stacked, numbered, and locked away until it's cleared by the lab. Once a specific batch of rubber is cleared, it will be used at a variety of places along the production line. The first of which is the calendar. Jose Robles was operating the calendar when I got there. The machine produces two products that make up the interior layers of the tire, fabric ply and steel belt, both of which are essential to strengthening the body of the tire. When I met up with Jose, the calendar was making steel belts. Now this process begins in the creel room, which is filled with over 1,000 spools of wire. These individual strands are laid out parallel to each other, forming a sheet of wire. Then the wire is fed down into the calendar below and combined with the rubber. So the rubber is fed in here. Right. And so the wires end up being embedded in the center of the rubber? Yes. There'd be a rubber on both sides, top and bottom of the wire. 
1,400 of them. Yes. When the steel belt comes off the calendar, it's in sheets that are five feet wide and 100 feet long. Next, it goes to the slitter, a machine that cuts angled pieces out of the large sheets that are precisely the right shape and size for each tire type made here. When layered together with fabric ply, the steel belt will provide strength for the body of the tire. While the interior tire body was being made, the exterior layers, the tread layer and the sidewall layer, were being produced on a nearby machine called the extruder. The extruder takes some of the same rubber that has been processed by the Banbury mixer and forms it into long strips. At this point, the tread is just smooth, soft rubber with no pattern yet. The extruder is overseen by Brian Whitehead, who has worked at the Lawton plant for over 17 years. It's extruder seven, and it's making our tread for our tires. It's forced through a die. Yes, sir. The rubber is extruded through the die, producing long strips. Brian told me that the strips would later be cut, forming the cap or tread of the tire. We have three different rubber compounds. Yes, sir. That, if I understand you right, are being pushed through this die. Yes, sir. Now, most people think of a tire as a single commodity, something that is molded or stamped out of a single piece of rubber. But after working on the calendar and the extruder, I began to really appreciate how many different layers and pieces have to be manufactured separately and then bonded together to form a tire. Automotive tires have come a long way in the last hundred years. This one from the early 1900s might well have been on a Model T Ford. Very narrow, no tread, and well, almost guaranteed not to give you the smoothest of rides. By the middle of the 20th century, tires would have looked like this. They still had tubes, but they also had a very well-defined tread, were much wider, and had some fashion elements, like the white wall. State-of-the-art tires, like this steel-belted radial, can be almost 12 inches wide, very low profiles, and this one can even run 200 miles at 50 miles an hour with no air. The tire has gone through many variations throughout its evolution, but an element that has always been vital is the bead. The bead is the steel cable that secures the tire to the rim. In the early days of tire building, making beads was an exhaustive process that required a worker to slowly operate a turntable with one hand while feeding the wire cable on with the other. Today, guys like Floyd Tennant can make 33,000 beads in a single shift. This beading machine spins large spools of wire into a second machine where they're compiled together for strength. As these wires are brought together, they're coated with the processed rubber produced by the Banbury. This rubber right here is going into this machine. Yes. And it's being softened. Yes. And then it gets forced out right here. That's correct. And coats all these wires at the same time. That's right. OK. Start the machine. It will cause the, uh, the forward to rotate. Huh. So it, I saw that happen. Those eight wires kind of came out. This drum grabbed them, pulled them. Now it's going to wrap them around here. How many, how many times? 18. Now one bead is made up of 18 rotations of each wire. As you can imagine, it goes through a lot of wire. In fact, while we were working, one of the spools ran empty and we had to replace it. Okay, I'm in. Boy, a thousand pounds is right. The bead is the final component that goes into making a tire. Once it's made, it's time to head to a giant tire building machine called the ARF or Automatic Radial Full Stage. It's daunting to look at, but Scott Miller showed me how it works. Here's a bead. This is a bead, yeah. That's what seals the tire to the rim. OK, it just comes down here. Slide that on. And where, where does it go? All the way in. OK. OK, now we've got our bead on. We're going to send our drum in. Okay. Just hit this little green button right here. The drum will swing in. We're going to apply our inner liner. 
and our gum guard on top of that. Inner liner. This is the inside of the tire. That's what seals in all the air. Okay. This is your gum guard. Okay. That protects the bead against the tire rim. All righty. We look at our splices. Everything looks good. It's all sealed up. Now we want to hit our cycle advance to apply our fly. Okay. And that's this button right here. Push it. Push it in. Now our fly comes up. Our beads come in. Oh, there they are. It's just amazing how these interior components were added to the tire. Each one had to fit just perfectly in order for the tire to be airtight. Once they were all there, giant bladders inflated to fold over the edges and hold it all together. Folded it over on top of the apex and the beads and everything. Seals it all up. Then it was time to add the sidewall. What is this called again? This is her sidewall. And what were you doing? Just I was just making a fly, sealing it up. Okay. Okay, now we want to get our stitcher up here. Stitch that down. Right here? Yes, sir. Scott and I checked to make sure that everything had lined up properly and all of the pieces were where they belonged. Then I added a barcode so that the tire could be tracked and hit the stitch out button. In a matter of seconds, the sidewall had been sewn to the tire and the process was complete. It's all a pretty quick process. Boy, it sure is. There's something happening here every second. Every second. Something's you're really going to be aware of what's next behind you, too. Now, that's finished as far as you're concerned. That's a green tire. That's what I make. That's a green tire. That's a green tire. It's going up, down the line. This is what's known as a green tire. It hasn't been cured yet. Curing is done in a press with a process called vulcanization. Vulcanization was the great discovery of inventor Charles Goodyear. Goodyear, who died long before the company that bears his name was even created, spent decades trying to figure out a practical way to use rubber in manufacturing. In the winter of 1839, he stumbled across it, literally, when he spilled a mixture of rubber and minerals onto his kitchen stove. The heat caused a chemical reaction, hardening the rubber compound, a process now known as vulcanization. To get a better understanding of vulcanization, I met with Eric Wamsley, a scientist in the Goodyear lab in Lawton. So Eric, is this what you'd call green rubber here? Yes, that's what we call green rubber. It's almost tar-like. Very much like. It is uh, sticky, gooey, it will flow on its own. And this is what we made the so-called green tires out of? Correct. Now, green rubber is not durable enough to be a tire. Even moderate pressure or heat or cold can cause it to lose its shape. But vulcanized rubber is sturdy. To vulcanize rubber, you need to add some chemicals like sulfur, which we did in the Banbury, and extreme heat, which is done by curing the tire. Eric showed me the difference. Where we've put the chemicals, Ron, is cured up into real tough, pliable rubber. And the side where we didn't put any chemicals is still real soft and virtually unchanged. Heat is the key step, just like we saw in the lab. Green tires are vulcanized with extreme heat in a machine called a curing press. But the curing press does more than just vulcanize the rubber. Each press is set to operate with a different mold designed to form a specific tire shape and tread pattern. It's the final step in making a tire. One of the press operators is Gary Roden, who let me pitch in. So Gary, this is referred to as a curing press, right? Yes, what, what actually happens here, and how does it work? OK, how, how it works, whenever you get what's called a green tire, the tires are loaded into the press, and you have what's called molds, which actually molds the tire, which gives it its tread, the, uh, the lettering, and all the shape, all, all the shape for the tire. Okay, how long does it take for that whole process to happen? Uh, depending on the type of tire that you have, like this particular setup right here runs anywhere between 11 to 12 minutes. 11 to 12 minutes, that's pretty fast. Yes. Can we do a couple? Yes, we sure can. All right. While Gary watched, I loaded the green tire onto the press. As the mold opened, the machine lifted the tires up and then expertly lowered them into the mold. 
Gary explained that an air bladder inflates inside the mold to press the pliable green rubber into the shape of the mold and to press the unique pattern into the smooth tread layer. After 12 minutes, the once pliable green tire is a tough, durable, hard rubber tire ready for the road. Well, will you look at that? Perfectly formed, treading everything. In 12 minutes, boy, they're hot. So that bladder, okay, drops down. And these arms lift it up, tip it, off they go. Once it comes out of the press, the tire cools on a conveyor belt and then goes through a series of tests and inspections. Operators inflate them and spin test them to make sure that they have been molded and cured uniformly. Chad Young showed me how simple it was to perform the final test, a hand and visual inspection. Hold it down. Now, now the base of the left hand go in there and you're gonna spin it with your right hand. This way? You try to get that table going at the same time. This way? <laughs> Okay. We make it look pretty easy. All right, so we spin it this way. Right. But you're, you're checking. You try to let that, you try to let your left hand be a free hand on it. Left hand be a free hand. Yeah, this your one? left hand, you know, just kind oh. of, just not really gripping that tire, but let it kind of flow around the edge of that tire. Flow around the edge. It's always amazing to me that in such an automated fabrication line, skilled hands are still needed to perform such essential steps. Once they've been inspected, the tires are stacked and bound and then packed into transportation trailers to be shipped to vehicle manufacturers and tire distributors. Soon, these tires will be put to the final and most important test, carrying people safely over the highways and byways of the world. everywhere, from automobiles to airplanes, bicycles to the space shuttle. No matter how complex their evolution may have been, the standard they must meet has remained unchanged. We count on them to get us where we're going and to get us there safely. That, as they say, is where the rubber meets the road. For the History Channel, I'm Ron Hazelton. Thanks for watching Hands-On History.